I'm Mary Beth King in Hawaii, and I'm going to take you on a sailplane ride over the island of Oahu. I'm David Karp in Nome, Alaska, and this is a Siberian Husky, and his daddy's going to take us on a wild dog sled ride. Hi, I'm Lance Nakasone in Hawaii, and I'm going to show you a spectacular volcanic eruption. I'm Michelle Martin, reporting from the Columbia Glacier in Alaska, and we're going to show you the birth of an iceberg. This, this is a report by kids from our newest states, Alaska and Hawaii. And Hawaii. We are from Alaska, the biggest state of all. Oh, we are from Alaska, Mount McKinley stands so tall. There's miles and miles of land up here, but if you want to try to see what God has made for us, my friend, you'll have to fly. There's dog sled rides or ice and snow and gold that's in the stream. We'll tan both day and night, the midnight sun will light our dream. There's black gold pumped up from the ground and through the pipeline goes. And floating icebergs in the sea are born from glacial flows. Old men and known they carve from bone on lonely winter nights. And salmon try to jump the falls, but then they spawn and die. White sand beach lays for you. Pineapple sweet, sugar cane, swaying palm and falling rain. Hula's dance and orchids grow. Soaring cliffs, waterfalls, jungle green on canyon walls. Up in Madnuska Valley in Alaska, we've got cabbages weighing 75 pounds. They never stop growing because the sun never sets. Would you believe we have the world's biggest rhubarb in Alaska? That's nothing. In Hawaii, we got violets eight feet tall. Yeah, Hawaii is really the neatest place. Take the rainforest. It's the wettest spot in the world. The summit of Waialeale gets 460 inches of rain a year. Well, what about Mount Alyeska in Alaska? We have 27 feet of snow. We've got the tallest mountain. Mount McKinley is the tallest mountain in the United States. <laughs> Yours may be the tallest, but we've got the hottest one. <laughs> Hi, Lance Nakasone again, and we're flying over the island of Hawaii, the biggest island in the Hawaiian group. It's the home of Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, the largest shield-type volcanoes in the world. They rise up more than five miles from the seafloor. You're looking at Kilauea, probably the most active volcano in the world. The Kilauea caldera is a lake of boiling lava. Lava is melted rock that has boiled up from beneath the earth. Each time there is an eruption, a huge amount of molten lava flows out, and the island grows a little bigger. In fact, all of the Hawaiian islands are made up of lava that has erupted here for millions of years. Michelle Martin reporting from the Glacier Queen in front of the Columbia Glacier in Alaska. Glaciers like this are solid packs of ice more than 300 to 400 feet above the water and as much as 400 feet below the water. They are slowly pressing their way to the sea. The Columbia Glacier stretches out over 17 miles up the valley. It is nearly a mile thick 
and nine miles across the face. Gradually, large chunks of ice break off and drift away in the form of huge icebergs. And when it happens, they call it calving. The horn helps. <laughs> And there you have it, the birth of an iceberg from the Columbia Glacier in Alaska. Alaska is so big and so rugged that there just aren't very many roads here. This is the largest seaplane base in the world. 45% of all the seaplanes that fly are based in Alaska. And there's good reason for it. A float plane can land almost any place where there's a little pond or a lake. There are many towns and villages in Alaska that you can only visit by airplane. David Karp has that story from St. Louis Island in the Bering Sea. We may not have many roads up here, but we do have some of the greatest pilots and the best air taxi service in the world. We are now at Gamble on St. Lawrence Island, nearly 200 miles away from Nome and 48 miles away from Siberia. We are waiting for the arrival of the mail plane from Nome. Less than 400 people live here, and the airplane is the only contact they have with the rest of the world. The nearest village is 40 miles away, and there are no roads. Everyone is anxious for a letter from friends, or maybe even a package they've ordered from the catalog. Even the groceries have to be shipped in by airplane. It's summertime now, but these airplanes fly even when it's 40 below zero. This is David Carp reporting from Gamble on St. Lawrence Island. This is Lance Nakasone, and it's a little bit warmer where I am in the Willy Willy Harbor on the beautiful island of Kauai, one of the eight islands in the Hawaiian group. I'm waiting for Seaflight, the hydrofoil jet boat that skims across the water at 50 miles an hour, and it's coming from Honolulu. Mary Beth King is aboard, so let's go meet her. Aloha, Mary Beth. Aloha. This is our traditional Maile Lei that we give here in Kauai. You ready to see the island? You bet. Let's go. It's hard to believe that the Hawaiian Islands were completely uninhabited until about 1,200 years ago when the Polynesians first came here, sailing in twin-hulled canoes. The catamarans you see today are replicas of those early Polynesian boats. And can you imagine sailing out over 2,000 miles of open sea in a boat like this? Those early Polynesians were great seamen. And to get around their new islands, they built small outrigger canoes made of koa wood. Canoe paddling is great fun, especially when you go out into the surf. This modern one you see here is made out of fiberglass and is patterned after the old Hawaiian canoe. Our paddlers all belong to one of the many canoe clubs here in the island. Our dog, Kilo, isn't a member, but he gets a great kick out of taking a ride. back in history. It was a religious ritual and performed by both men and women. Nowadays, practically every little girl raised in Hawaii learns the hula. And believe it or not, the slippery slide goes back in history for thousands of years. 
Millions of people slid down the slide and wore the stone smooth. I think I'll give it a try. famous spouting horn on the island of Kauai. The waves come roaring through volcanic lava tubes and make a sound like a horn. You suppose they call that blow the old horn? Hmm. Sheba, what you doing? Here it goes. Squeak Richard it. Burmeister keeps over 30 Siberian huskies. And when it's feeding time, they really get excited. Oh, yeah, that's the boy. Shake hands. That's it. That's it. That's the boy. That's the boy. Love you, baby. Love you. That's it. That's it. That's it. Come on. There it is. Come on. That's the boy. Hey, Missy girl. During hey. an average year, they'll eat over 8,800 pounds of dog food. When you're a dog musher like Richard Burmeister, you have to figure out a way to give your dogs training in the summer months when there is no snow in Nome. And here is the solution. An old VW chassis on wheels became the sled. The dogs had a great time pulling it through the streets of Nome, and the kids had a great time riding. Mush! Okay, let's go. <laughs> change the lead dog, it would work. <laughs> Another tradition like the dog sled, the Eskimo dance. These dancers are from King Island, just off the coast of Alaska. And their dances have been handed down through the generations. Gilbert Taksak is learning from the elders and now performs with the troop. Yay! To preserve all the old games that were played by the Eskimos, each year we hold the Native Olympics. These kids are practicing. Yay! This is called the high kick. One, two, three, go. Go, 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 go! And this is leg wrestling. The stick pull. And the seal hop. Harry Kazad is one of our top Eskimo carvers. You file this part a little bit and do the same thing to the other side and round this 
part. You're never too young to learn, and he's already teaching his nine-year-old son, Brian, to carve whales and seals from walrus tusks. On St. Lawrence Island, my friend Brian Cazada asked me to join him on a whale hunt. This is one of the few places in the world where the Eskimos still hunt whales in the Umiak sailboat covered with walrus hide. We didn't harpoon a whale that day, but when the Eskimos do catch one, they share it with the whole village. side stretched out on this frame is being split using a nulu knife. It takes great skill to split it, just to the right thickness. A huge hide like this can be used to build another umiak boat, or perhaps a blanket for the blanket toss. Nowadays the blanket toss is done just for tours, and sometimes just for fun. <laughs> but back in the old days, this was the way an Eskimo hunter could see out a long distance to see if there was any game to hunt. Something really different brought a lot of people to Alaska, and that was the discovery of gold. We're here at the headwaters of the Snake River, just a few miles away from where the first gold was discovered in Alaska. A lot of people still do prospecting here. In fact, I'm going to try some myself. Can you show me how to do some of this? Sure. Okay, shake it around hard and let the gold settle right in the bottom there. Yeah. You mean all the gold that's heavier than the rest of the stuff? Mm-hmm. And you see it sparkle when, it, when, you, when you see the gold. I see it. Wow. See it down there? See it shining, just kind of glittering in the sunlight yeah. there? The little stuff? Another kind of gold promises to be even more important to Alaska. Black gold in the form of crude oil being pumped through the Alaska pipeline and hauled away in tankers from the Port of Valdez. The pipeline and Alaskan oil will help solve America's growing energy problem. Fishing, and particularly salmon fishing, is perhaps the most important Alaskan industry. We're at Ninilchik on the Kenai Peninsula, where the fishing fleet is getting ready to go after the silver salmon. While thousands of salmon are taken each year, thousands more escape the nets to swim back upstream. A few may wind up on a fisherman's line, but most survive to lay their eggs in the shallow headwaters of Alaska's streams, and then die in a mysterious cycle of nature. Well, if you haven't guessed it, we're back in Hawaii, on the island of Oahu, in the pineapple fields. And this is the way they grow. It takes nearly two years for the pineapple to ripen. And unlike other fruits, it doesn't continue to ripen after it has been picked. So these harvesters have to know exactly when to pick the pineapple. Pineapple is one of Hawaii's most important industries. The tourist trade is probably the most important industry in Hawaii. And we hope that you'll come to see us someday. We have visitors here from all over the world who come to bathe in the sun and the spirit of aloha. There are just hundreds of exciting things to do, but perhaps one of the most spectacular is a helicopter ride through Aimea Canyon on the island of Kauai.
Hundreds of visitors come here every year to the Arizona Memorial in Pearl Harbor. It was on this very spot in 1941 that the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor began. This memorial was built over the sunken hull of the battleship Arizona. It is a memorial to the several thousand men who died there that Sunday morning and to the more than 1,200 men who lie trapped in the hull beneath the water. We have our share of tourists in Alaska too, and a lot of them come to Mount Alyeska Resort to ski or just to enjoy the view. And what better place to try out a summer run with this beautiful team of Samoyeds? But first, we have to take them up the chairlift. ride over the north shore of Oahu. Once the tow plane gets you in the air, they drop the rope and you're as free as a bird. from our newest states, Alaska and Hawaii. I still say you don't have any palm trees. You don't have any icebergs in Hawaii, so we're even. <laughs> 